All right, we're rolling. All right, so just to make sure that the formula was in fact correct, I went right over to ASTM E1444, cut and pasted it right out of there. That is exactly the formula that we are using. We cross-checked all of the, you know, what is tau, what is NI, NH. Got it right, so I don't know what to say about that huge number. So an alternative. Well, there's a couple of alternatives. Um, one, why was this not a problem for me when I was doing engines? Because I had a process spec out of Lycoming and Continental that clearly stated exactly what to do and how many amps to give it. It was a little weird that it was the exact same amount because it would just say, like I told you before, crankshaft, circular, and longitudinal amperage 2000. There was no distinction between the two. And the funny thing is my old machine, it would give me as much amps through the coil as it would in a headshot. The minute I got this machine up and running, I called Magnaflux and said, I think something's wrong with it. I'm not getting enough current out of the coil. And their answer was, because you're not doing the formula. And I'm like, I know, but I still think I should be getting more amps. So there it is. Uh, okay, so let's see. IX, which should be 9, in lieu of a formula. A Hall effects meter. Meter can be used. Which is a meter, which you've all seen, that we should use to make sure that we have the proper amount of flux density in the part. So it is either 30 to 60. Um, I forgot to pronounce it. What was it? Oysters. Oysters. I always want to say it. it's Oysters. like Oysters. no, it's Ersteds. Ersteds, um, or Gauss, which is easier to say. Um, G A U S S or point zero zero three to point zero zero six Teslas. So you can do that until you get the right one. So. As a level one, you're not going to make this determination. Somebody's going to hand it to you. As a level two, almost pretty much the same thing. You might be involved in it, but you're going to be getting uh, a process spec. But if you don't, you have to understand how to get one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what else? Yeah, I had the process spec. Just told me. I told you that. The, the other thing you can do is if you, I don't want to say trial and error. It's a bad way. You can't can't do that. You can. I shouldn't. I was gonna say you can. You can kind of tell when you. You can absolutely tell when you have too much amps, but it's kind of hard to tell when you don't have enough. Um, but you do it enough, and you kind of can see it. You just do it, and you're like something's not right. And then you look down, like oh, you yeah, know, I had on the wrong setting or something like that. But you get to this picture in your head of what it's supposed to look like, and when it doesn't, you know to go check something. Uh, okay, moving on. Does you have any questions on that? Let me see. Before we move on, let me check. Checking my PowerPoint here. Oh yeah, we got that. All right, because I added some slides. This is the Hall effects meter right there. Thank you for that. Hall effects meter. I did not have one of these. I'm still kind of learning how to use it. I think one of the things I've been doing wrong is you're actually, I've watched, got my YouTube certification in Hall Effects. You're supposed to press down on it with your finger. A couple of people do that. I'm like, why are they doing that? But I saw two people doing it. And one guy said, yeah, you got to press down on it with your finger. So we'll try that and see what happens. All right. Uh, what if you have a hollow part? <coughs> Like, for lack of a better term, and this is how it came up when I was in the school, gun barrels. And you want to check the inside of a gun barrel. Well, what was fascinating to me is that when you take a part like this barrel or a pipe, if you will, so I don't offend anybody because guns are scary. And you put this pipe in a headshot and you hit it, which way am I going to see cracks? on the longitudinal axis, but only on the outside. You will not see them on the inside. 
the only way to see them on the inside is to put it on a bar. So you've seen the bars that I have inside the magnet. Well, you have to actually have a bar and you have to put the bar inside of it, which will show you the inside. But if you do a headshot, how, how come it doesn't? I don't even know why. It's, you know, I'm going to say skin effect. It goes outside. I, it's crazy. I'm like, what? You know, I was actually shocked by that. It didn't make sense to me. So, um, then you do, and then you get it's into this whole problem with how are you getting the light in there because you still have to have the right number, uh, 1,000 microwatts per uh, square centimeter inside there. So, how are you getting that? What's your method? And so it began this whole thing. So I'm like, well, it's, you know, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Ultrasound, yeah, I just switched to something else. Uh, so parts that are hollow should be placed or need to be placed and they call it a central conductor on a central conductor which is just a rod and then we'll use a headshot <laughs> And this is the only way to inspect the interior. Uh, or this is the only way to inspect the interior. Yes. So in something like that, if you are using the rod, would it give you the in or would it show you the outside and the inside? Just the inside? And you're gonna ask that. Because I was going to say the keto swing. Yeah, so it's outside. The keto's worked on the outside, right? Yeah. So inside, outside. Gotcha. Good, po good point. And I was like, how is it inside, outside? Yeah. But I always assumed it was the outside. And I was afraid to tell you that I had to make that assumption. But yeah, it, it worked. Because that's how I would do a lot of things. Put them on a rod. So, all right. Three. So we figured out... A lot of things. We figured out if we want AC or DC. Do we cover that already? Because I know I covered it across the street. So AC or first, yeah. I'm sorry. So for all I know. So I accept your apology. So. Um, what do you? How do you calculate then the amperage that you put into it? Is it the radius of the hollow part or the radius of that conductor that you're then using? There is a formula that I. Okay. I all of the parts that I was able to do, I did it at diameter times a thousand. And it worked out just fine. But I know that there's some crazy, if you think we've seen some crazy formulas, nah, there's even worse formulas. So, okay. and it talks about where the uh, flux densities are gonna be and everything. So a little beyond where I wanna go with this. Or even I know it for a fact, but I use D times a thousand. So typically I'm looking at crank uh, piston pins. A lot of times I do piston pins. So piston pins, but only like combing piston pins for the most part because Continentals have built-in pl plugs that you can't take out. So they have, well, we'll talk about it next class, but uh, Continental uses steel piston pins. That's the thing that connects the piston to the uh, connecting rod. Um, they have a one-piece, Thin ass dude too, you know what I mean? And you're like, I'll put a thousand amps through it. Four thousand amps or nothing. Like, liquid penetrated. No. Mm -hmm. You want to see sparks. No, I don't. Whatever. I got confused and measured their circumference instead of the diameter of <laughs> eight thousand amps through it. Now it's a puddle in my machine. These are coming out early. Okay. So these are some of the things that I would have had to magnify. Magnetic part of inspect. Um, but we're talking about piston pins. So, light combing piston pins. In automotive, you might call them wrist pins. These come out. So, central conductor. Right? And so, it was this easy way to do it. Put it on a central conductor instead of putting this between the pads. And then I could stack six of them or so and do wet continuous and then pull them out and inspect them. Um, but these are aluminum piston pins. This is not a continental. This is a one-piece aluminum pin out on the outside. So this part's steel. This part's aluminum, and it's one piece. 
So it goes all the way through. You can't pull these out. If you pull them out, it means it's broken in the middle somewhere. So coil shot it, rotate, coil shot it? So, yeah, so this, is, this would be a hard one to put in the pads, although this is metal, so it will transfer, um, transfer current. You just want to be careful that you didn't damage the end. So you're not going to put this on a central conductor. Um, so I want to check it both ways. So you could put it in a coil, and you're going to get indications this way. So if the coil is going this way, put it in there. And then you could put it that way in there. That would be really close to the... Uh, I don't know. I think I would go a headshot on that. Thankfully, I replaced them in overhaul, so maybe that's why I don't remember because I never used them. Um, I usually ended up rejecting them, and you don't reuse them on overhaul, so. But I think Lycoming lettuce on the thick walled. It's been a while. Um, which way would it tend to crack? So the Probably. pistons here and the connecting rod goes in the middle, so they're under. Are they under shear load or tension load? Shear. 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 So I'm going to be looking for cracks this way anyway. I want to say. I wish I could find that service bolt in somewhere, the old one. Might have just said or longitudinal on these. What about something like this? It's a cam. It's a camshaft out of a radial engine. We don't call it a camshaft. We call it a cam here. So put it on a put it on a rod and so the biggest rod I could get. Yeah, and then and then I'm looking for cracks radiating out this way. So and going across here like on that. On the teeth. In the teeth, yes. Well, then I'd have to be very careful because this is a ramp surface, but do a headshot. But I have to mark it somewhere. I talked about this with you guys. So, like right there, you see that hole? That's the only hole on it, right? Well, no, there's another hole in the middle. You want another one in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> the one like it right there. So, I would use this as a, a marking point, and I put it in the heads so that. It was like that, and do a do a headshot, and then take it out, inspect all of the teeth all the way around, both ways, like I showed you guys. Everything on this side, put it back in with that right there, demagnetize it, then rotate it so that little dots that way, and do it again. So I've got a 90 degree, so 290 degrees. Done a lot of these. First, I have to take it apart, which I don't want to. How would you do something like that? Ah, cool. Okay, I do a central rod, which would show me cracks going this way. Mm -hmm. And it would also work on the inside. I'm probably going to get a really heavy indication right through here. Why is that? Yeah, stress, high stress, stress points, prop up, right? Keto. Prop up, um, keyway. Oh, okay. Keyway's going to have a lot of flux to get you up here. Oh, I see. Oh, so that would be a non-relevant indication potential. That looks like it's cracked. We can so check it. We can do it tomorrow. Um, I was going to ask, we uh, talked uh, numerous times about um, continental lycoming engines. Which ones do you prefer? <laughs> Everybody asks me that. Um, I don't. Chevy. <laughs> Chevy. Each, yeah. one, each one has its... its, its what That's do I prefer? Down. Continental or lycoming? Lycoming tends to use the same parts throughout its whole series. I love that. Um, so you can get parts for an O, especially the three twenties and up. It's the same stuff. Like the three sixties is a four cylinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one more cylinder. You have a five forty. So it's like backwards compatible. Same cylinders, a lot of the same pistons, same gears, same everything. It ain't broke. So it makes parts a lot cheaper. So you need a you need a gear. Well, the same gear was used in the two ninety, two thirty five, three sixty. 540s. So you can still find replacement parts even for engines that like are no longer made, or? Uh, you're talking about the 290. They can be pretty pricey, so but there are people that make them. Continental, on the other hand, they have engines that are so different from each other. The 0200, 0300, they're the same except the 0200 has four cylinders, the 0300 has six. So they did like what Continental did. Then they went to the 360s, which is a six-cylinder instead of a four-cylinder, so it's a lot smoother. And the 240, same engines, one has four, one has six. They kind of do the same thing, but Continental just lumps it. 200s, 300s, 240s, 360s. Then you get into the big bores, the 470s, 520s, 550s. And they don't use many of the same parts, some of them, so they're just totally different. 
anyway, off the subject. All right, so we did a, we did a social conductor. Anything else? I didn't put about this way. Well shot. Well shot. Yeah, have it, can we have it sitting on the central conductor and just sit right in the center and smack it with cool shot? Yep, but you're in the center. So you increase the, if you can, increase yep. your current. If you can. Just crank it to 11. What is this? Uh, rocker arm? Rocker arm. How do you do rocker arms? Another tube going through and then coil on it? These stupid little things. How many of these are there on a six cylinder engine? Two times each. <laughs> Twelve, yeah. So twelve of them. So you have twelve of these dumb little things. <laughs> so <laughs> you clearly have a lot of animosity for them. Uh, rock arms have gotten me into trouble in my lifetime. So and I don't. It's a topic for another class, but the problem with rocker arms is you're allowed to reuse them, and you do reuse them, but the book only allows you to knock out the bushing and rebush them, which I never enjoy doing anyway because it's just rebushing. And they don't allow you to reface the feet. So don't get me started, but you get all this alignment issues we'll talk about next class. And you end up getting a rocker arm that's basically coming down sideways on something. It'll push the uh, valve sideways and we're out of valve guide. So now you got engine problems. So the only way to do it is to make sure that that foot comes down absolutely perfectly square. My fingers are here. On on the valve and push it down perfectly square. The only way to do that is to grind the face, but you're not allowed to grind the face. And so they just want you to rebush it and put it back in. It's like, so you end up with this brand new $50,000, $100,000 engine with mismatched parts in it that are pushing sideways, and I hate that. So. And you, and you can't just say, oh, no, just buy new ones. Well, who's to say that they're going to be compatible? Because when you think about all the alignment issues, again, you've really got me going now. You've got a seat, a guide boss, then a guide goes in the guide boss. See, I did bore the guide boss, the hole in the cylinder. Then you have to put in a guide, then you bore the guide. So there's two places you could have been off. Then you've got a rocker shaft that runs through with either two or four bushings across. That could have been this way a little bit. Then, you, so this could be off, this could be off. Then you're going to put this in the middle with this bushing in there that could be off. So how many offs? potentials do you have? Oh, then God. you've got just this face against the valve, which could also be off. So it's this nearly impossible angle. So I developed this system and tooling in our shop, and I'll show you how to do it. It was really easy because I figured it out. How hard could it be? Um, where I made sure they came down straight and, and didn't have any problems. So except for the problem I for doing it where I got in trouble. So other than that problem. Uh, okay. So back to where we started. You're hoping I'd forget. Um, starting at the beginning, we're going to mag magnetic particle inspect a part. So we had two choices right up front, which was AC or DC. What kind of current are we going to use? All right. And how did we make this determination? Surface or subsurface? Okay, if it's a surface, it's been in use part, and we're probably going to be using? AC. AC, because the skin effect gives me good uh, indications on the surface. If it's a new part that's going out into the production, we're checking production runs, we're checking for inclusions and stuff deep in the metal, we're going to use? DC. DC, okay, so we're going to do this part, then the next thing we're going to decide uh, to a certain extent what kind of machine we're going to use but if we're in aerospace we're pretty much going to use a bench method anyway so we'll just kind of stick with that so we have our bench uh, we're going to put the part in the next thing we're going to have to figure out is are we going to do headshot or coil shot uh, circular or longitudinal uh, we figure out okay I'm going to do both and the very next thing we're going to determine is which first how to, how to put it in there okay which first um the which first should be a headshot, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. So we do a headshot, then we're gonna have to figure out amperage. amperage, how many amps to use, and then we'll have an, and then okay, so we're gonna do a headshot, how many amps? Then the next thing we're to choose after that is AC or DC. current to D mag. No, we haven't got that far. So I, I've said I'm gonna do AC. Oh. I said I'm gonna do a headshot. Oh, I decided I'm gonna do 2,000 amps. Now I'm going to have to make a decision on application all right if it's 
it's just a bench machine. Well, you're not going to use dry powder. I don't, why would you? Um, you're going to use wet, the wet media or medium. And is it going to be continuous or residual? So that is two methods of wet. So we, did, we are using wet media right here. Um, so two methods of wet media application. Really, I could have just said two methods of application because it works for anything. It doesn't. But we're talking about wet here, so I'm just sticking with wet. So we have wet continuous, which is a bit of a misnomer. So what you do is, right, you soak the part. You're going to get it very soaked, and everything is running all over it. So you're going to take some time to do that. Because if you miss a section, then it tends to stay dry when you're in a hurry. You follow what I'm saying with that? So if everything gets wet, you spend the time going around the part, getting it wet. When you just start and go over it like that, it tends to flow everywhere. Otherwise, if you have a dry spot, it tends to want to flow around the dry spot, which is kind of a weird thing, but it does. So wet continuous for the wet system implies that you're going to apply the current while you're putting the media on, but you don't in the wet system. In the wet system, you get it very, very wet. And as you get it soaking wet, you stop the flow, hit the button for the amps. You don't flow at the same time. The reason why is because you could wash away an indication because the amount of time that you're giving it current only is one half of a second, twice. So two half second bursts, it's not enough time to do it wet anyway. So um, that's how you do it. So media is applied. is applied. I don't even have it right in my notes. Um, and then current is applied immediately as flow is stopped. I'm talking immediately. It's not stop the flow, set the nozzle down, look for the button and push it. Yeah, you just waited too long. Now you're residual. So it is wet, stop, push. That fast. What if you like wet one side and then you have to wet the other side, but then the, the side that you first wetted, like time to drain? Time to drain is fine. Okay. Just don't disturb it. Okay. In fact, sometimes you want to give it a little bit of time little puddles build up and it makes it hard so so I don't have a problem with that um, I want to um, if media is still flowing when current stops there is is a risk of washing away indications, which makes your job easier. I have never found a part. So we have wet continuous, which is kind of not wet continuous, and then residual. So residual media oops, is applied after magnetism is stopped. And this just flat out does not work, does not work for parts with low retentivity. Um, I could go back up here, wet continuous, this is definitely preferred. 
and more of the aerospace way of doing things, residual would not be the preferred method. Why is that? I don't know. So this is, it's kind of a tricky thing to explain, but, and, and I think I've tried to convey it across the groups as we've been in there. You want to do what you're supposed to do, which is wet continuous. <coughs> there are a lot of times I will rely on residual because you can use a residual magnetism if there's a discontinuity and you can pull it back out. So in other words, I do a wet continuous, I look at the part and I see some sort of indication. And I can't really even stress how, you know, how difficult it is sometimes to make these decisions. You know, they're life or death decisions of the part, which can cost somebody thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on your judgment call. So you don't have the luxury just going, yeah, it's probably a crack. You can buy a new $10,000 crankshaft. What do you mean there aren't any? Well, what are you going to do? So, but at the same time, if you don't call something and somebody crashes and dies, well, that's on you too. So you have all of the weight on you for making these decisions. And a lot of these decisions aren't that cut and dry. You can't just look at something and go, well, that's a crack. And that is not, and that is, and that's not. It's just like... It's, it's not easy. So thus the, the requirement for experience and, and even in my shop, I, would, I could teach people, like I've taught you how to, how to do it, but for the first several months after I taught anybody to do it and left them in the booth, I pretty much was spending my day walking back into the booth. You know, okay, I've got another one. It's like, all right, no, that's nothing. Okay, that's something, you know, so um, it takes a while. But my point being, so I do something, I do wet continuous, and I get some sort of indication. You get a lot of false indications. It could be anything from a soap line. Soap lines are doing a lot. Um, sometimes a little bit of oil will come back out, and you got to redo it. All kinds of weird things. Well, so let's say I get a little indication on there. And you guys have seen me because it just instinctively I'll, I'll wipe it with my finger. Or I always keep a little bit of scotch bright in the, in the, in the booth. And so I'll wipe it with my finger, put a little uh, fluid back on it. What did I just do? I went from wet continuous to residual. So did I meet the requirement of the test or did I violate it? Violated. I completely violated it. But what happens if that line comes back? Well, it's bad. <laughs> it was bad. So it was bad enough that it came back under residual. So can I get in trouble for using residual and claiming that it, the part has a, a discontinuity? No. no. Absolutely not. You can do that all day long. But okay, so I wipe it and I put a little bit of fluid on it. It doesn't come back. Like, oh, it didn't come back. It was just a piece of, it was just some soap line or some reason. What's that? You can't do that. I cannot do that. It's got to go back in the booth, and you've got to redo that area using the method that you were supposed to use. Treat it as if it's bad until it's good. Right. Um, the other problem you have is, uh, go ahead. Well, how, how do you prove that it's good? Okay, so I have some sort of indication. And I'm not sure is it, and, and that's where you have to go through, what brought that out? So um, I wipe it or I put a little scotch bright on it and then I put it back in the booth and I do a wet continuous and it doesn't come back at all. He just can't bring it back. Well, then it was nothing. It was in fact some sort of fuzz or um, you get weird stuff in there. Um, a piece of soap, like, cause we use the hot seat which has soap in it. Ours doesn't have very much, but mine had a lot more in it. And every now and then it didn't get 100%. They missed a little spot with cleaning or something. And so you just have a little soap residue line on it, like a water spot. Is another way of putting it, a water spot. So a water spot, the fluid will build up around that water spot. Would you recommend taking pictures of any indication that you find at, the, at that moment and then clean it and then if it doesn't come back, take a picture of the same spot? Or is that not necessary? It's hard to say it's not necessary. There, that's a, it's a fine idea, but I think in practicality, you're going to spend most of your day taking pictures. <laughs> so it's very rare that you just put a crankshaft in there and look at one end the other and go, well, that was easy. And it's always something. That was a little something somewhere. Um, sometimes you will have shot it with a little more amperage than you wanted to, 
after looking at it and you go, or maybe it was great for the cross-sectional area of most of the part, but you have a smaller spot and you can see some stuff in there. And I'd be careful I say this, sometimes a little bit of residual works better at that point because you don't have quite as much, but you have to know what parts will have residual and what parts just won't. Uh, this one, I don't think there'd be any very, very little residual. It's, it's pointless, it's, it's not hardened, it's pretty soft. The only they hardened that little spot right there, and that's it. Uh, you were talking about too much about because if you over juice it, then you get too many indications, or you get oh yeah, you get, especially like you guys did connecting rod today. You see, they're all over the place, weren't they? They're a little bit too much. So connecting rods are soft. They're very soft. Uh, the one we're playing with in the booth, nobody's noticed. But I bent the crap out of it just trying to crack it. I couldn't, but. Um, so no residual on that one, but too much, you get a lot in the webbing because they're shaped yeah. like that. So you get a lot of leaks right in this area here. Gears, same thing. You get a lot of little leaks in there. Um, all right, so just, that's kind of how you deal with it. And then sometimes cracks are just easy i mean i've you know you guys have seen the big cracks in the crankshafts I mean, that's just that's a great day you know you know it's not on you it's just obviously cracked it's just those intermediate things that are like i don't know is it cracked is it not you know and it's nobody else to ask but you you're the guy you got to make that call so um there have been times where i've pretty much done things to parts that more or less was against the rules like grinding um not a grinder but you know aggressively polish in a way that probably would be frowned upon yeah i want to see that because every time i hear grind i'm just imagining you with an angle grinder and hard angle, just like nah, i want to get this round okay you know what i had i had a air powered angle grinder like you were using today but not that nasty of one and i had a whole selection of rubber abrasive discs i mean so you could put it on there and just yeah, lean into it and it would hardly do anything so yeah or it's Nowadays, I guess I'd probably use a Dremel or something, just a little Dremel with a little rubber disc on it. It has abrasive, and you just kind of polish that little area a little bit and just see what it does. It's either going to immediately go away or start getting bigger. So if it immediately went away, then I'll well, solve that problem. Uh, but if it <laughs> gets bigger, solve that problem too because <laughs> you get to make that call. Either way, it's not your problem. Either. It is not. Um, yeah, I think not the worst thing, but it just sucks because a lot of we didn't do grinding. There's a thing called crankshaft grinding where you go undersize. We didn't do grinding and renitriding, so I would check a crankshaft before we shipped it because the shipping's really expensive, and it would really suck if you shipped out a crankshaft, like happened to Larry. We looked at it here; there were no cracks, and then they rejected it after he paid for the shipping because they found a crack. Well. Yeah, it got dropped. I can tell you that, but it would suck. We saw it. It was yeah, it was bulging and stuff. But it sucks in your shop if you send out something saying, "Yeah, there's no cracks," and it comes back, "Oh, it it was cracked. You missed it." And you're like, "Ooh, that would be that would suck." And that never happened, thankfully. Uh, okay. Let's see. So there's a two method of applying. So we've applied our our media. We've either determined that it's good or it's not good, and we want to move on to our next test. So maybe we've done, well, I prefer to do a head shot first, then a coil shot. I don't have really great reasons for it. It's just the way I did it. Um, I've always trusted the head shot a little bit more with the direct magnetization than the indirect. So I like that. The problem with, um, a headshot. What is the problem with a headshot in in um, detecting magnetism? Yeah, it's very hard to tell because it's coiled. It's very hard to because right. it's not circular. coiled. Circular. <laughs> Roundy bit. So the theory would be, you have a part, you put it in, and you do a headshot, and you can't really tell that it's magnetized very well with a field indicator for sure. A gauze or a Tesla meter will help you to point. Uh, you do your inspection, 
then if you were to stop there and demagnetize it, it's hard to know. Did I really demagnetize it? Did I really have it magnetized? Right? Because you, you had no indication to begin with. I'd use a Gauss meter because it's all circular magnetism. Nothing's leaking out that way, so I use a field meter and it's fully magnetized. And what's the field meter say? Barely anything. I got a little bit of magnetism. All right, so I demagnetize it and do up this, and eh, a little bit less than it was before. That's you know, that's kind of what it looks like. But the nice thing is, if if you do something in a headshot, and you decide, okay, it's it's I'm moving on. I always demagnetized everything before I did my next shot, and so I demagnetize it, and then I put it in the in a, a coil and remagnetize it. And now, what is a field meter going to say? Oh, man, I got a lot of magnetism because it's going this way and coming out and flowing back around. So it's all this magnetism leaking. So you can really see on a meter that you have a lot of magnetism. Well, what does that do for you when you demagnetize it? Now you have a good basis. You've got a fantastic basis. Now, part like this, it works fantastic. It's small. It's easy to work with. When you're working with long crankshafts, it doesn't work as well because the coil has to go in multiple places. And so it just doesn't work as well. But part like that, it makes perfect sense. So I always did headshots first, followed up by the coil for that reason. Because the headshot, you can't tell when you're fully demagnetized. But when you remagnetize it in a coil, then you can fully see the magnetism and you can fully see when it's gone. So um, let's see, demagnetizing. So demagnetizing. Is reducing the residual uh, field, I'll call it field, could have said magnetism, to an acceptable level. Notice I didn't say you removed all the magnetism because you're not going to. It is generally Less than, some books say two, some say three, so I'll go with the higher number. Less than three gauss. I don't know if I read this somewhere or if it's just my policy was a part should be demagnetized. After a headshot, um, I don't want to say headshot. Between headshot and cool shot? Yeah, I like that better. Between shots, betwixt. Like I said, I, I don't know if it says that somewhere when I wrote this, which is the way I do things, but it's the way I do things. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, part of it was just a, uh, maybe a fear of something happening, but this is the way it works. So if I put something in a, in a head and I give it a magnetizing force of, say, 2,000 amps, and then I've inspected it, and then I put it in the coil and I give it a shot with amperage, my machine would go equal, but um, amperage that did not exceed the head shot. So now I've given it maybe 75% magnetism of what I just gave it before. What does that do to that field in the part? Yeah, that gives you a fuzzy reading, huh? Yeah, it's not going to re figure all the domains are perfectly lined up. It's not going to realign them. So I want to make sure I realign it. So the only way to make sure that happens is to make sure that when you go for the next set of, of, of shots that you have in fact increased the magnetizing power. Well, if you demagnetize between the two, then you don't have to worry about it. So I give it a headshot of 3000 amps and then I demagnetize it. I got a fresh clean slate when I go in the coil and as long as I've given it enough to make it show an indication, I'm good to go. I have no fears. Otherwise, I'm going to be left with some sort of vector kind of current or something uh, indication that I don't, I don't want to deal with. Um, if I were doing a part in a coil, say I'm going to do this in the coil, so I'm going to just do it this way, then this way, then I wouldn't worry about it. I put it in the coil, I set it in the bottom of the coil, set it for, you know, 1200 amps, and then I would just take it and bump it up just half a number or go to the next setting, 
and put it this way. I have increased it. So I don't have to take the time to demagnetize it. Follow? Mm -hmm. So I just gotta move to the side. All right, what else do I got before it's time to go? So I'm having fun now. I hope Cooper's back tomorrow. You guys are boring. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll just write what I put. So failure to demagnetize. Magnetize. Um, I'll just put this like, after a headshot example. Um, headshot and performing a coil shot and a coil shot. If that makes sense. So let me see. Preferred for after headshot and before. Failure to demagnetize before changing between the shots. Yes, between changing between shots um, can lead to um, vectored magnetism. Which is probably something that I'm more paranoid about happening because even if you got a 45 degree vector and you want it at full 90, you're going to get 45 off of that and it should show. I just worry that I didn't get enough magnetism for it to work. So, and I put not true, not true if magnetizing force. Uh, I'll say second shot. is more than first shot. Notice I didn't say amperage. I said magnetizing force. It's two different things because as you can see it's two different formulas between a coil and a headshot. Okay, that's a good place to stop, I guess.